Good day, my dear postgraduate students. Nice addressing you after a long, long break. This day shall be important in the sense I'm starting with series of questions important for postgraduates. Grossing the larynx. Your voice can change the world. Barack Obama. Now that I am presenting a class on larynx, I hit upon this quote, which I felt would be apt, as we shall be seeing during the process of the class. The presentation includes normal anatomical structures, anatomical components in pathology, differential diagnosis of laryngeal neoplasm, gross description, AP and sagittal views, dissection, photographs and diagram to supplement. The grossing procedure per se, the checklist, IHC and the references. This itself will mean that I have taken a laborious task. Courtesy, teach me anatomy. A so-called simplistic diagram displaying the nasal sinuses, the oral cavity, and then our friend, the larynx, which itself looks very complex. An epiglottis, glottis, subglottis, the vocal cords, trachea. We shall see what else is there in store for us. Here, I am finding the fold of the epiglottis, the hyoid bone that is supporting it. The airy epiglottic fold, the thyroid cartilage. All these spotted areas are cartilages. So there is a cricoid cartilage below that and the tracheal rings lower down. There is a false cord and a true vocal cord. Of course, there are some straps of muscles which I can make out. I find that the larynx goes down into the trachea and the phonation is the key. Now, when it comes to the study of the larynx, it means what I had shown you in the picture earlier, the supraglottis, the epiglottis, the glottis, and the subglottis as such. So, you will have to mention exactly what side it is, right, middle, or left. And the false cord or the true cord, the sinus of Morgani, the laryngeal ventricle, lingual aspect and the laryngeal aspect of the epiglottis, the glottis, the true cords as such. The subglottis, again, involving the vocal cords, and here again, there can be tubes. Transglottic, whether this is applicable to us or not. Why I am repeatedly reading this is, this will unravel the complex nature of the sample that we are going to study. Before going per se, I would try to complete the lymphatic drainage. As I told you, there is the vocal cord. If it is going to be above that, that region, it is a superior jugular group. And if it is below that, it is an inferior jugular. So we shall remember the two groups of lymphatics for the time being. Above is superior, below is inferior. The anatomical components will be including the various things that I had mentioned. And what we are supposed to do is to measure the larynx in its three dimensions and all the structures that we had been mentioned. Along with that, there has to be a comment on the tracheostomy site if present. It has got its own importance. And as I've been telling you people, the other structures such as the cervical esophagus, the thyroid, extra laryngeal soft tissue muscle and other relevant tissue. The specimen integrity, whether it is intact or it has already been opened, these should be commented on.
Now, whenever I talk about tumors, that can be the laryngeal tumors, the hypopharyngeal tumors, glottic tumors, supraglottic tumors. So, we will have to know the extent of the tumor as it is. What the author says is, try to compare it with the uterus and cervix. That is quite complex. And when you open, you find that there are multiple structures by the side, such as the fallopian tube, the ligaments, and the ovary. So also here. That is a good analogy. The hypopharyngeal tumors. The slicing of it, we shall be mentioning. And why this complexity? The glottic tumors. You'll have to take multiple bits, not only from the mucosa, but also from the submucosal tissue, right into the cricoid cartilage, so on. So the sampling will be or should be adequate so as to tell us the extent of the tube. And also the resected margins that are important. So I think this particular picture, a little picture is worth a million words. All that I have blabbered, put it on one side. I am seeing a coronal section. Coronal section is what I am seeing by the side or anterior posterior. So from the posterior aspect, I am able to make out the tongue. So this is the epiglottis. The hyoid bone is over here. It has been cut. And this is the larynx and it is displaying a friable growth over here. Also, as I had mentioned earlier, there will be the cartilage, the thyroid cartilage and the tricoid cartilage lower down the tracheal cartilage. And this is the trachea. The rings of trachea can be made over. So what extent is the tumor extending? Now, this is a nightmare for the surgeon also. He does not know the extent of it. And even if it is going to be a microscopic remnant, the patient still has a malignant. So, to put things straight, we have gone to the sagittal view. Sagittal is perpendicular of this. And see what is happening over here. So, there is a growth. And here again, there is a cartilage by the side, the vestibular fold, etc. I am able to make these out. All the other structures are seen almost cut across. If I were to give a bit Along the long axial line, what will happen? I may be getting definitely a good size of the tumor, but will it be adequate? It is compared by the authors very well by producing a series of cross sections. In this one, the growth is fine. Here, it appears to be going even more, whereas four and five are totally free of it. So this will tell us the extent to which the tumor grows, the fascia, the underlying structures, and so on. The differential diagnosis shall be including dysplasia. Repeatedly, the authors say only few things. There can be a dysplasia, there can be a carcinoma in situ. Squamous cell carcinoma is the malignancy of the day. Rarely we can have an adenosquamous carcinoma and still very, very rarely there can be a mucoepidermoid carcinoma from an ancillary salivary gland in that region. This is what we should be having in mind. And please do remember this growth is extremely friable. We cannot be meddling. This is a nomenclature that has been given for the intraepithelial neoplasm. So it can be a carcinoma, a carcinoma in situ, or sometimes it is just mentioned as a proliferative lesion or a dysplasia, moderate or severe and so on. So this I would like you people to kindly complete for the sake of completion. A beautiful picture, thanks to the references that I shall be quoting. So this is the anterior aspect, wherein I am finding a larynx that is completely covered by the muscle, the face shape, and so on. So it is almost complete. And whenever we do a grossing, we are supposed to comment on the integrity of the specimen as well as whether it is intact 
or open. So this is the laryngectomy anterior aspect. A checklist is always needed. It can be almost similar to your CAP protocol that you people are following for the various tumors. Tumor, whether it is present or not, what is the number, size, etc. And has there been any other benign disease? Yes or no. The tumor size in three dimensions. The tumor site involvement, whether it is solitary or multiple again. The hypopharynx, spiriform sinus, post-cricoid area, and the extension into the supraglottic area. These are all the things that we will have to mention in the checklist. So this is one of the best references I could quote, classification of laryngeal dysplasia. I would like you people to kindly go through it. And it is not the purpose for the reference alone that I'm putting it. Thanks to Royal College of Pathologists from Australia, which mentioned Slutwig. This author is known to have his name mentioned in multiple superlative references. Macroscopically, what do you see? Whether it is the thyroid, laryngeal cartilage, extra laryngeal tissues and so on, the thyroid gland, and also the tumor, whether it is exophytic, endophytic, ulcerative, or it is just a fibrous thickening. And what are the distances from the margins? This will be extremely important. That will tell us the extent to which the surgery has been successful. You will have to mention the various sites. And also the tracheostomy. This is something that we will have to mention repeatedly. Whether the patient has had a tracheostomy done or not. And whether that particular site is free of tumor or not. For each of the specimen containers, this is the usual protocol. You'll add a number and then do the various things. And this is simply what we know. This is a list of what we already know. If it is going to be a small tumor, it is all in good. Fine. But if it is larger than 10 millimeters, then multiple slices will have to be given. Sometimes it is quite long, as I had shown you in the picture, in which case your judgment matters a lot. The relationship with the trachea and the caudal margins will be very important for both the surgical clearance as well as the function. For the glottic and the supraglottic carcinomas, the relationship to the tongue matters. And tracheostomy site, I have already mentioned. The types of the surgeries. It is asked for almost any organ. Here, it can be a partial laryngectomy wherein a small part is removed so that the function of speech is retained. Supraglottic laryngectomy removes some of the larynx located above the vocal cords. Here again, some kind of normal speaking is possible. Hemilaryngectomy, on the contrary, there is a limited speaking that is available, whereas Total laryngectomy, it has to be completely replaced by a esophageal speech. This is again from the clinician's point of view. But for us, how do we grade it? This is a much better method, which I would like you people to kindly remember. Laryngeal and hypopharyngeal surgery. It can be transoval. And you find that it is a conservative surgery and it can be done by laser or robotic. This is one. Or there can be an open surgery which can again be conservative or radical. If it is going to be conservative, there can be a vertical supraglottic or a supracricoid types of laryngectomy is possible. And in this one, there is a near total laryngectomy and a total laryngectomy. Finally, that will be replaced by prosthesis. So this particular types of surgeries, I would like you people to remember so that in case you have a specimen or when you are asked, you are able to answer. So this is one. Epiglottis, a pyriform sinus. This is again a very notorious area for a malignancy. The various parts are over here. And look at this one. As multiple bits are being given, the extent of the tumor invasion can be made. So here in this case, 
it is almost close to the esophageal entrance. So this is something to worry about. So what is important here is preservation of the specimen or perfection. You people should decide. I'll show you again in the consecutive pictures. Now we go to reality. This is a photograph of a mounted specimen, courtesy Royal College of Pathologists, Australia. All the structures that I had mentioned earlier are here. The hyoid bone, the epiglottis, then the glottic tumor is over here. Large, irregular, friable, grayish white tumor that is going quite down. And this has been kept separated by means of an artificial stick. This is again, this is what I said. Here, multiple slices are made through and through and the higher cartilage is removed from the soft tissues so that you get a complete bit of the entire circumference that is in bone. That is being reflected in this particular region. A to this. I shall be showing you again a picture of it. Now you people will be able to understand the importance of it when it is being cut across. If not at a higher magnification. Look at this, the extent to which the tumor goes. So it is important. Which is more involving? D probably is. So this is, whereas these are all quite free of tumor. So this is quite important and this has to be substantiated with your histological diagnosis. And I can see the external inking also that is there, which is one of the prerogatives for crossing. The depth of invasion and the involvement of the adjacent tissue. Two points alone you people remember. There's a reference for the pathology outlines over here. Crossing again, this is reviewed, courtesy to pathology outlines. So there has to be a inking, and then fixation, removal of the bone, slicing that is present at serial intervals, and all the adjoining tissue also. At least one centimeter from the tumor, you'll have to give a soft tissue, and then a soft tissue that is totally uninvolved with the tumor, non-neoplastic mucus. All these will have to be submitted for examination. Here again, it is a review. It is a replication of what I had told you earlier. You people can recite it yourself. So finally, when you do give a report, it has to be based on this. What is the tumor size, the location, histological pattern, grading of the tumor, depth of invasion, pattern of invasion, and the status of the resected margins, vascular, perineural, almost identical to your CAP protocol. Lymph nodes at different levels are there. Which one is being involved? And finally, the TNM stage. And after the staging, there is something called as immunohistochemistry and the genetic study as such. The CTTN and the FACT genes are supposed to be inducing aggressive behavior of the tumor. And similarly, the nanog expression, the human nanog protein is supposed to be associated with the pluripotency and the aggression of the tumor. There are other things such as the narrow band imaging as well as the SOX2 gene amplification, which are useful in deciding the aggression of the tumor, which may not be decided by histological grading. Also. So these again are the references. I would like you people to kindly go through it. Wonderful work these people have done. And remember this stout, his name is found almost in many places. Words mean more than what is set down on paper. It takes the human voice to infuse them with deeper meaning. Thank you for your patient listening.